Here's, I think this is what I'm going to do. I was uh, talking to one of my, I was talking to my uh, executive team a couple of weeks ago and Mike Pickett here, we were talking about how do we celebrate my 55th anniversary of the night the Lord changed my life. That's March the 23rd, will be 55 years ago when I was uh, 18 years old. And um, we were talking about how do we celebrate? And M Mike just suggested, why don't you just share some of the revelations that God has given you that have changed your life? And I've been thinking about that. And last week, Jamie and I were in Cancun. That's our annual week off. And uh, we were down in Cancun. And I just started writing a little booklet. And I don't have it with me tonight. It's not finished yet. But I just started going through and thinking about what has God done in my life and how did he touch me? And, and it's really not to draw attention to me, but to say that any good thing that has ever happened in my life is because of God revealing himself to me. And let me just sit, spend a second here saying that there's a difference between just knowledge and revelation knowledge. A person can sit there and listen to somebody else and they could gain information but it's only revelation knowledge when it doesn't come from the outside in, but it comes from the inside out. You might hear somebody say something and it makes sense to you, but it has to come from the heart. Your heart has to embrace it and receive it. And uh, so I'm just gonna go through and I've got about 15 revelations that only take me up through my Vietnam time, <laughs> amen. And I've got a lot of revelation since that time. But I just want to go through and share with you some of the basic things. And these are things that really I think every person needs to have in order to see God really manifest himself in their life. You know, I'm assuming and I'm praying that every one of you came here because you know that Jesus is the answer to whatever your problem is. Amen. Jesus is the one that's transformed every one of us. And he's provided everything that you will ever need. It's not us trying to get God to do anything. He's done everything that we will ever need through Jesus. But there is a part that we have to play. We have to get revelation of it. We have to have the word of God come alive in our life. And so I'm going to be sharing just some of these things with you. But uh, this is going to sound really elementary at first. Hold on and we'll get to some other things. But this is really good that as I was thinking about this, actually it started 65 years ago when I was eight years old. Uh, I was in church at eight years old and our Baptist pastor preached a message entitled A Tour of Hell. And, and as an eight-year-old, this really impacted me because he not only was uh, the thing that really impacted me was he was saying good people don't go to heaven and bad people don't go to hell, which is exactly what I thought the situation was. And he explained that it's only people who accept Jesus and receive the forgiveness through Jesus that go to heaven. And it's only people who reject Jesus that go to hell. And then he started naming names of people that I had heard of at eight years old, people that were famous, that were in the news. And he started naming names of people that split hell wide open. And they were the famous people. They were rich people. They were famous people. They were entertainers and things. You know, and before I get to that point, let me just say that one of the reasons I think that we aren't making more of an impact is because ministers have gotten uh, timid and shy, and we're so worried about saying something and people being offended that we, we just say things in generality and don't point things out. But this pastor, he was naming names and it shocked me to think that these people who I had admired and thought were good went to hell. And I didn't respond during that invitation, but I tell you, when I got home, I got my dad right after we got home from church and I said, what is he talking about? And my dad began to explain to me about how all of us all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. And it doesn't matter whether you live good relative to somebody else. We've all sinned. We all need salvation. There is nobody that's going to stand before God based on their own goodness. And I began to be convicted as an eight-year-old and recognize that I was headed to hell. And I know some people today, they think, well, what could you have done as an eight-year-old? 
You know, I could spend all night tonight just talking about this. I'm going to go on quickly and say some things. But see, this is one of the things that's wrong with our thinking today. People basically believe that good people go to heaven, bad people go to hell. If you're good outweighs your bad, you're okay. But no, the scripture teaches that all of us have sinned and come short. We were born in sin is what David said in Psalms chapter 51. And that isn't talking about that his mother was in an adulterous affair. It was saying that every one of us, as we were born, were born with the sin nature. And you don't have to do anything to go to hell. You're already headed there. You know, when I first got turned on to the Lord, we went and printed up tracks and we would go to bars and we would pass this out. This probably isn't the best way to do it, but <laughs> it makes my point. And we printed out this track and on the front, it says what you must do to go to hell. And you open it up and it was totally blank. And then you turn it over to the back page and it says, that's right, you're already headed there. Repent or else turn or burn. <laughs> So anyway, I got a revelation of hell and it dawned on me that unless I accepted Jesus, I was going to be going to hell. And did you know, as an eight year old right there in my bedroom, my dad prayed with me and I got born again. Praise God for a dad that knew the word of God and told me the truth. And I got saved at eight years old. And I tell you, it was a genuine experience. I left there and I mean, I was under conviction and when I prayed, the scripture says that the Holy Spirit bears witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. Now, I'm going to be going through a lot of things, but we've got people from every different walk of life. We've got people at every different stage of life. And somebody, if you will pay attention, if you don't know Jesus, hopefully some of the things I'm saying will help you and bring you to a place where you also could receive but we're going to go on and talk to people who are believers. But if there's anybody who doesn't know the Lord, when I prayed that prayer, I got just a supernatural peace and assurance that I was born again. It wasn't just something I did uh, parroting words after my dad. I mean, I had conviction. It was revelation knowledge from the Holy Spirit about the existence of hell and that someday I was going to stand before God and have to give an account for myself. And Jesus was the only hope I ever had of making it. And so, man, I confessed the Lord. And when I did, I had a supernatural peace come over me. And I mean, I just went out and played. That's all it was. It wasn't anything spectacular. It wasn't a Damascus Road experience. I didn't see a light but I just had supernatural peace and I knew that I was born again. And the very next day in school, that was on a Sunday, and the very next day when I went to school, my friend said, what happened to you? They could tell a difference in me and I told them I got born again, I got saved. And my friends the next day made fun of me for being a Christian and laughed and talked about it. And you know, as an eight year old, I didn't care. I knew something had happened to me and I passed from death unto life. So I got a revelation of hell that got my attention. Then I got a revelation that Jesus was the only salvation that you could, that the only way that you could ever get there and that it came not by me being good, but by just accepting Jesus. So those are the first two revelations that I got. But then, you know, after that, I went to church. And when I went to church, I began to learn some wrong things. I don't think it was malicious on anybody's part, but what I learned was that God's love for me was conditional and it depended on if I did everything right. And I began to start, I mean, I was genuinely changed and I loved God with all of my heart and I wanted to serve God. But what I started doing was trying to do all of these things, not out of love and response to God, but trying to get God to respond to me. Now, if you're already born again, baptized in the Holy Spirit, you may think that the things I'm talking about, you've already got those under your belt and so you don't worry about it. But this is something that I think that most people struggle with. Religion has misrepresented God that you've got to earn his favor. They may not always put it in those words, but I've had thousands of people that I pray for. And when I pray for them, they have a sense of unworthiness. They think that they don't deserve the blessing of God. And newsflash, you don't, <laughs> amen. But the good news is that you don't get what you deserve. You get what Jesus has done for you. It's all based on what he has done. But see, I began to start being told that you have to do all of these things. And my life was genuinely changed. 
And from the age of eight years old, when I accepted the Lord, I have been seeking God my entire life. I have never quit seeking God. Now I did a lot of dumb things the way that all of us have done. But I mean, I was seeking God and the things that I did were basically by mistake. I've never said a word of profanity in my life. I've never taken a drink of liquor. I never smoked a cigarette, never tasted coffee, which some of you think coffee, man, you got a scripture to stand on for coffee. It says you can drink any deadly thing and it shall not harm you. Praise God. But I'm saying I just was seeking God with my whole heart and it was, it was good in a sense. It kept me from getting into some of the sin that has damaged and scarred so many people. But the worst sin of all is self-righteousness, trusting in your own goodness. I honestly believe that being self-righteous is worse than being a, a, a homosexual, worse than being a murderer, adulterer, or anything else because your faith is in yourself. There's a lot of people that have done terrible sins, adultery, all kinds of things, but they know it's wrong and they uh, recognize their need for God. But a self-righteous person gets to thinking that, God, you owe me something because look what I've done. And I fell into that and I became a Pharisee of the Pharisees. And I didn't intend to do it, but I did. And I, I forced myself. I was an introvert. I was afraid to talk to a person. I couldn't look at a person that I didn't already know and have as a friend. I couldn't look at them and talk to them. But I forced myself to go out and make visits during the week. I'd make 10, 20 visits a week, knocking on doors and witnessing to people. And yet I was petrified, but I was more petrified of God not accepting me. And so I let my fear of God rejecting me overcome my fear of what people might say. And I was going through all of these motions but I got to trusting in myself. And then on March the 23rd, 1968, I was in a prayer meeting on, uh, on a, a Saturday night. This will give you an indication of how religious I had become because every Saturday night, I and all of my friends and some of the leaders of the church would meet together and we'd pray from 10 until 10.30 every Saturday night. That's what I did. And we were getting ready to pray. I won't go through the whole thing, but God showed up. How dare him come and interrupt a prayer meeting? We just had our own little 30 minute prayer meeting and, and then we were gone. But man, he messed the whole thing up and showed up and the glory of God appeared. I don't know how to explain this to you. I don't understand it. But all of a sudden, I just saw the glory of God. I saw the holiness of God. It wasn't something I saw with my eyes. I didn't hear anything audibly, but I got a revelation of the awesomeness, the purity, the holiness of God. God was in that room. And normally my prayers would go two or three minutes and they were real superficial and uh, it was over. But man, that night when I saw the glory of God, here's another revelation. And this is something that a lot of people don't have that when I saw God's holiness, all of my holiness, all of my self-righteousness in comparison to God's holiness was like a filthy rag. That's what it says in Isaiah chapter 64, verse six. And I saw that and for the first time in my life, I realized that there was nothing that I could ever do to approach unto God's holiness and become acceptable to him based on my goodness. Now I was already born again, but even though I was born again, I, I got saved by grace by putting faith in what Jesus did, but I had fallen into the deception that I was going to earn his favor, his answers to prayer and blessings in my life through the things that I did. And so I was doing all of these things thinking he was going to respond to me and then I was somehow or another worthy of it. And I was feeling really good about myself because I was holier than anybody I knew. <laughs> I'm not saying that in a proud way at all. I'm just saying it's absolutely the truth. I didn't know anybody who was, you know, not doing all of the things that you were supposed to do and who was going to, I mean, I never missed church. I went to church, I remember in high school, having uh, semester exams and stuff. And yet we had a revival at the church and I wasn't going to sit there and miss a revival meeting. And so I skipped out and nearly flunked all of those exams. But man, I went to church every time the doors were open. I was there five or six times a week. That was my whole life. And I was just doing the best I could and I felt really good 
and thinking that, God, you must move in my life now. But when I saw the glory of God compared to him, boy, I recognized for the first time in my life that I didn't deserve a thing. And so instead of a two or three minute prayer, I wound up repenting, turning myself inside out, apologizing. I didn't even realize how bad self-righteousness was. I didn't know it. I honestly felt pretty good about myself. But when I saw the glory of God, man, I, was, I honestly was afraid that God was going to kill me. I know some of you think that's an exaggeration, but that's what I thought. I thought God was going to kill me when I saw how ungodly I was. And for some of you who maybe, you know, you've done a lot more things than what I've done and you're thinking, how could you feel that way if you've never done all of these things? I tell you, a person, let me say, I'm saying this in love, but any of you who think that you're pretty awesome, you have never seen the glory of God. Those of you that are really pleased with your performance and thinking that you are, you know, God is really blessed and pleased to have someone like you. <laughs> you don't really know God. I'm not saying that you aren't born again. I'm not saying that if you were to die, you wouldn't go to heaven, but you have not seen the glory of God. You look in scripture and any time somebody really saw the glory of God, like in Isaiah chapter six, when Isaiah saw the Lord high and lifted up and his train filled the temple and the glory of God filled the temple. He fell on his face and he said, Oh God, depart from me. I'm a man of unclean lips and dwell in the midst of people of unclean lips. You can just go right down the line. Daniel, he fell at his feet as if he was dead and had to have an angel supernaturally come and strengthen him. You can see Peter in the New Testament that after, you know, Jesus was resurrected from the dead, man, he, he uh, felt like he was naked and, and clothed himself and he fell on his knees and uh, apologized to Jesus for denying him and on and on we could go. But I can tell you, brothers and sisters, I, I, brothers only, <laughs> brothers, I can tell you, nobody here has got gender dysphoria, do they? <laughs> but I can tell you that if you haven't ever come to the end of yourself, you've never really started experiencing God. And again, there's degrees of this. We're all in the process. You know, if the Lord was to show us everything all at once, I don't think any of us could live with ourselves. You know, when Adam and Eve sinned, they said we were naked. That's all that they knew. They didn't understand exactly what they'd done. If God had shown them all of the Hitler's and all of the Mussolini's and the people that have destroyed and murdered millions of people in the hurt and pain. If he was just to have shown Adam all of the problems that have happened in your life and my life, Adam couldn't have lived with himself. It would have destroyed him. He didn't understand the fullness of what had happened, but he realized that he wasn't right. He wasn't uh, worthy to stand in the presence of God. And so I'm aware that none of us have the full revelation. If God showed us everything, we couldn't stand it. But I got a super revelation of my relative unworthiness, which some people think, well, that's not good. Our society today really promotes feeling good about yourself and having a positive self-image. Man, I hadn't got time to explain this. I'm going through things quickly. But let me say that you shouldn't have a positive self-image. You ought to have a positive Christ image, who you are in Christ. You need to find your new identity in Christ, but you should not be excited about how awesome you are. And some of you are thinking, but you don't know how awesome I am. <laughs> Again, you hadn't seen the glory of God. When we stand before the Lord, I guarantee you, we're, it's going to all be different. I haven't seen the fullness of God, but I have a glimpse of the glory of God. And once you see that, it just puts you in a different place. And let me share some scriptures with you here that relate to this. Out of 1 Peter chapter 5, uh, the same thing is said in John, uh, James chapter 4, but in 1 Peter chapter uh, 5 and in verse 5, it says, Likewise, ye younger, submit yourselves unto the elder, 
Yea, all of you be subject one to another and be clothed with humility for God resists the proud and giveth grace to the humble. You know, when we talk about humility, most people don't understand this properly. We have a thought that humility is weakness. Meekness is weakness. That this is a person who's beat down and just hates themselves and stuff. Did you know actually a person who is timid and shy like I was talking about, do you know what that is? It's pride. Again, most people think pride. No, pride is arrogance, thinking you're better than everybody else. Well, the simplest way, you can describe this in a lot of different ways, but if you take the word P-R-I-D-E, I is the center letter in the word pride, and pride in its simplest forms is just focused on yourself. And you can be focused on yourself thinking you're better than everybody else. That is pride. But did you know focused on yourself thinking you're worse than everybody else and that nothing ever works for me? That is pride. Matter of fact, I'm not going to take time to go into great ex uh, explanation, but in Numbers chapter 12, it talks about Miriam and Aaron, Moses' brother and sister that came out against him and criticized him because he was a Middle Eastern you know, type of complexion. And he married an Ethiopian woman, a black woman. It, woman. it was an interracial marriage. And they came out and criticized him because of an interracial marriage. And God struck Miriam with leprosy because she had come out against the man of God. And it says there in Numbers chapter 12, verse 3, it says, Now Moses was the meekest man, was very meek above all men which were upon the face of the earth. What a statement. There was millions of people on the earth. You know, Moses led over 3 million Jews out of Egypt and they were the minority. So there was more than 3 million in Egypt. And then there was all of the other people. There was tens of millions of people on the earth at that time. And Moses was the meekest man on the earth. And you know what makes that even worse or more amazing? Moses is the guy that wrote that. <laughs> Moses said, I am the meekest man on the face of the earth. Now, see, that just blows most people's uh, definition of, of humility because if you're humble, you just, you just feel terrible about yourself. I heard a story about a church that took a vote one time to find out who the most humble person in the whole place was. And so they took a vote and everybody agreed. It was this dear old brother so-and-so. He was the most humble person. So on Sunday morning, they had him get up in front of the whole group and they gave him a humble button that was this big and it was red with white letters on it that said humble and they pinned it to him. And because he accepted it, they took it away. <laughs> if you were truly humble, you would not never admit it. And that's what most people think that humility is, is just being beat down and feeling bad about yourself. But here's Moses saying, I'm the meekest man on the face of the earth. You know, I believe that you could redefine humility. It's not just arrogance, thinking you're better. And it's, uh, you can be debased in thinking that you're the worst person in here. But you know, that would be pride. You are focused on yourself. You are only thinking about yourself. And it doesn't matter if self is exalted or if self is debased. That's not true humility. Humility is just saying about yourself what God says. Finding your identity in Him and not in your own accomplishments not your own identity. Moses was told by God that he was the meekest man on the earth. He was inspired to write it. And if Moses had not written that, he wouldn't have been meek. He would have been proud. Did you know pride is just exalting your will? If you are self-willed, if you're what our society calls a self-made man, you're a proud person. A truly humble person is a person that will give all the glory to God. That doesn't mean that you sit there and deny the fact that God has done something good through you. You could have great talents. You could have been very productive. You may be a, a great businessman. You may be a great sports person. There's nothing wrong with acknowledging that you've done something good as long as you aren't taking credit. As long as you recognize it's God that gave you your abilities. It's God that does everything. A humble person doesn't deny that God has done something good through them. They just give all the glory to God. 
Moses was the meekest man on the face of the earth. And yet he was so strong in who he was in God that when Korah, Dathan, and Abiram came out against him in the 16th chapter of the book of Numbers and began to criticize him, they snubbed him. And I won't go into the whole story, but finally he just said, if these people die a natural death, then you'll know that God didn't send me to be a prophet. But if something brand new happens that has never happened before, if the earth opens up and swallows them alive into the pit, then you'll know that I'm a man of God. That's meekness. That's humility. He knew who he was, but his identity was in God and he gave the credit to God. So anyway, what I'm saying is that when I got this revelation of God's glory and my relative unworthiness, it made me realize that I had been trusting in myself. I was thinking that I was good enough that God was going to move in my life. And in hindsight, I just praise God for the way that he started me in my relationship with him because he knocked the wind out of me. He gave me a revelation that without God, I am nothing. Jesus said that in John chapter 15, verse five, without me, you can do nothing. Now the good news is I'm never without him. And so I can do all things through Christ, but it's all things through Christ. You'll have a lot of self-help people that'll sit there and say, you need to have a positive self-esteem. You need to recognize you can do everything. That's not true. You need to recognize that you can do nothing, but through him, you can do everything. Your confidence needs to be in the Lord. And man, I didn't have that. So when God showed me all of this, it just literally knocked the legs out from under me. It made me prostrate on my face in front of God. And it started me on a journey that, boy, I just praise God for that. Matter of fact, I won't tell you the names of people, but I was just reading about some of the movers and shakers in the body of Christ just yesterday. I was looking them up on Wikipedia and I was reading about them and they now are in lawsuits. Things are falling apart. Things aren't working. And as I read through, you know what it was? It was pride. God used them. I don't know how many of you saw the movie about Jesus revolution. Any of you see that? A lot of you. And I didn't know anything about Lonnie Frisbee. I'd never heard of him. I'd heard of Chuck Smith and, and uh, Greg Lowry. And I was a part of the Jesus movement. And uh, Arthur Blessett, who was a big part of that, they didn't give him any credit in that, but man, he was a huge part of the Jesus movement. He's a personal friend of mine. So anyway, I was aware of some of that, but I hadn't heard about that Lonnie Frisbee. And man, I was so impressed. I started looking him up and you know, even though God used him and man, I think he was, he was awesome the way he was portrayed in that movie. Did you know he had come out of a drug uh, background and homosexual background and he one time described himself as a nudist uh, vegetarian hippie. That's the way he described himself. And anyway, he got in problems with Chuck Smith as it was described in that movie. And he got hurt. And then he got into uh, helping uh, Bill Johnson. And Bill Johnson again separated from him and he got hurt. And anyway, he got lifted up with pride. A scripture goes along with this is Proverbs chapter 13, verse 10, only by pride comes contention. It didn't say it's a leading factor. It's the only factor. Only by pride comes contention. It is not what people do to you that makes you hurt and that causes contention. It's what's inside of you that causes contention. If you were dead to yourself, you wouldn't care so much about people rejecting you. It's only when you are in pride, which again, isn't only arrogance, but it's just self-dependence, promoting of self. Only then is when you get hurt. And so anyway, through this, Lon Lonnie Frisbee got hurt and uh, the story goes on. He died, I believe it was, in, I, I may miss the thing, but I think it was 1993. Does anybody know for sure? I think he died in 1993 of AIDS. He had gone back into homosexuality. He would have uh, relationships on Saturday night and get up on Sunday morning and preach. And anyway, he never promoted homosexuality. He said he knew it was sin, it was wrong. He repented and he got right with God and his best friend, I heard a video where his best friend was talking about it and he was in love with God and he went out with a shout, but he died of AIDS and he had a horrible death and you know what caused all that? 
multiple things, but it was pride. It was the fact that when he was rejected by people, he got hurt. And in hindsight, I look back and I just praise God that he pulled that pride rug out from under me from the very beginning because that is Satan's biggest inroad into your life. Here's a scripture in Jeremiah chapter 10, verse 23 that says, Oh Lord, I know that the way of man is not in himself. It is not in man that walks to direct his own steps. Again, this is contrary to our thinking. Most of us, I'm a self-made man. I got to depend on myself. Nobody else is going to help me. I don't believe we should be looking to government. We shouldn't be looking to a handout, but we should be looking to God and recognize that without Him, we're nothing. We shouldn't have self-confidence. We ought to have God confidence. We ought to be confident in who He is. Because I'm telling you, brothers, that I don't care how well you are. You could be, you know, one of these 10 talent persons that have all of this talent. And people who are so talented and so strong in themselves, in a way, I pity you because it's hard for you to trust in God. And I don't care how many talents you got, how strong you are, you will come to the end of yourself. You will crash and burn someday. When I first got into ministry, I, most people wouldn't come to my meetings or to my church. And so I had to go into jails and prisons and into nursing homes because they'd let anybody go in there. And I remember going into these nursing homes and it was good for me because I remember this one woman in particular, she was a Methodist pastor's wife and she was 80 something years old and real frail. And yet this woman always had her hair fixed. She was always wearing fancy clothes. You could tell that at one time she was the socialite of the thing. She was very well off and stuff. And yet she would sit there and just cry all day long. And I would go in and visit with her every single week. And she would tell me about what it used to be like and how people used to think she was somebody special. And yet now her family wouldn't even come see her. I was the only pe person that would go visit her and she was just miserable. And it was so good for me to see a person that in, in their prime had everything going for them. They were hitting on all cylinders, but if nothing else, old age is going to catch up with you. And someday you'll recognize that you are not able to make it on your own. Would to God that all of us could get that revelation while we still have enough, uh, you know, strength in us to be able to change things and begin to depend upon God. And I know I'm speaking to guys and guys are just, you know, famous for being the man and macho and you're going to do things. But man, you need to come to the end of yourself before you really start experiencing the fullness of God. And so that's what happened to me in 1968. And let me just add a little footnote to this. You don't ever arrive and just make a decision one time and that's it. But that's when it began. And God has every day you know, the scripture says in Romans chapter 12, verse one, I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your body a living sacrifice. That means it's not a one-time deal. You just have to make that decision over and over. I started this process March the 23rd, 1968. But every day of my life, I have to choose to continue to walk in that and to glorify God and put him in his proper place and put me in my proper place. So it's not, a, it's not something, you know, I haven't arrived, but praise God, I left. I got started. So this is saying that you have to humble yourself under the mighty hand of God. And the reason you do that is because God resists the proud and gives grace to the humble. Again, pride isn't just arrogant, thinking you're better than everybody else, but pride could be dependence upon yourself. Matter of fact, if you continue to read, I'm trying to cram a lot into this, but in verse nine, it says, humble yourselves therefore under the mighty hand of God that he may exalt you in due time. And then in verse seven, casting all your care upon him because he cares for you. These are not disconnected verses. One of the ways you can tell if you're humble Man, brace yourself for this. You know how you can tell if you're humble? If you're humble, you have cast your care over on the Lord. If you are burdened, if you're worried about how am I going to make this work? How is this business going to work out? How can I fix this? 
Again, so many of us men, we're all fi we're fix it guys. We always want to fix something and we really depend that we can just fix anything. And boy, when you run up against some things that are beyond your control, you can stay up all night worrying about it and wondering how am I going to make this work? You can tell where you are in your relationship with God by have you cast your care over on the Lord or are you burdened by it? Are you worried? Are you frustrated? Are you burned out? If there's anybody here that just feels like, man, you're running on empty, it's because you have been running your life. When you plug into God, when you humble yourself and make him the strength of your life, there is no limit to his strength. You don't wear out. He gives you supernatural ability to deal with things. So he's saying that God resists you when you're in pride. Now, this isn't him resisting you in the sense that he doesn't love you or that he's against you, but God is not going to pour out his blessings upon you unless you humble yourself and give him the credit and trust him and let him work through you. Because for a number of things, one of the things is he loves you. And if he was to bless you and give you all of the things that you're desiring and if he gave those things to you and you weren't humble, if you weren't dependent upon God, if you were still a self-willed person that is going to do things your own way, you'd mess the whole thing up. You know, I was talking to a pastor today and we've known each other for 46 years. And he said, man, back then when we first met, our ministry was really small. He wasn't even in the ministry at that time. And he was saying, what would have happened, Andrew, if God would have given you all of the responsibility, all of the things that you've got right now? What would happen if he had given that to you 46 years ago? I don't know for sure, but it wouldn't have been good. <laughs> it wouldn't have been good. It, it would have destroyed me. It would have overwhelmed me. You know, we got to have millions. and We have, I think it's 7 million a month we've got to have just to pay our bills. We got 1,100 employees. We got so many things going that there is zero way I could have handled it. One of the reasons God didn't bless me and promote me, I've known since March the 23rd, 1968, that someday I was gonna minister to people all around the world. And that's what I've been headed towards and praying for for 55 years. But if God would have answered those prayers back then, it would have literally destroyed me. I couldn't have handled it. So one of the reasons that God didn't answer those prayers and that God didn't open up doors and give me some of the opportunities that I've got today is because he loved me and he knew I couldn't handle it. He knew it would have destroyed me. And I'm saying, brothers, it's the same thing for you. There's many of you that know that there's more than what you've experienced you have a desire and you may be praying for God to increase your business, to increase your influence, to whatever it is. And yet I can guarantee you, God's going to give it to you as you can handle it. I think it's Deuteronomy chapter seven, verse 22, if I'm not mistaken, that the Lord was talking to, uh, through Moses, talking to the children of Israel. And he said, you won't possess the land all at once. I'm going to give it to you little by little, lest the beast of the field multiply. In other words, God wanted to give them the entire promised land, but he says, I'm not going to give it to you all at once because the beasts of the field would multiply. The thorns would take over. You'd lose all of the advantage. You can't occupy it. I'm going to give it to you as you're able to receive it. When I first got started again, I knew that God wanted me to reach people all over the world. And I used to pray all of the time, God, use me, God, use me. And I just beg God, God, open up doors. And finally, the Lord spoke to me one day and he said, the reason I don't use you is because you aren't usable. He said, quit praying, God use me and pray, God make me usable. And he says, when you get usable, I'll use you. God wants to use me more than I want him to use me. God wants to bless you and open up doors for you more than you want him to do it. But if you are operating in pride, God will resist that pride because he knows that if he did give you the things that you are desiring, and if your heart wasn't right, if your heart wasn't in the right position with him, it would destroy you. Over in 1 Peter chapter six, uh, excuse me, 1 Timothy chapter six, it says the love of money is the root of all evil. Not money, but it's the love of money. It says in Proverbs, he that hastens to be rich 
has an evil eye. There's nothing wrong with riches, but if your lust is for riches, there's something wrong. And it goes on to say in 1 Corinthians 6, I believe verse 11, that those who desire to be rich pierce themselves through with many sorrows and hurtful lust, which drown man in perdition and destruction. Money is necessary. Prosperity is necessary for us to fulfill God's given purpose for our life. But if you aren't careful, that money can corrupt you. And so God isn't going to bless you with the finances and the things that you need if it's going to wind up destroying you because he loves you. It's not because he doesn't love you. It's because he does love you. Praise God that the Lord didn't answer my prayers 50 something years ago and give me all of the things that are happening in my life right now because it would have destroyed me. And this is what's happened to so many people. They know what God has and they kick the doors open instead of letting God open up a door which no man can shut. And they make things happen. And if you happen to be one of those 10 talent guys, you go out and try and make it all happen on your own. You know, one of the blessings... And I'm not trying to criticize myself, but I am not a 10 talent guy. I'm just pretty simple. <laughs> and and uh, one of the blessings of being like I am is that unless God promotes me, I'm not going to get promoted. I don't have a great charisma. I don't speak properly. You know, I was going through the transcripts. When I do a television program, they will send me what I did last time and they'll send me the transcript because we have to have closed captioning and I'll read through the transcripts to see where I was so that I won't, you know, that I'll be able to teach uh, consistent with the last time I taught. And when I read those transcripts, it's terrible. The way I talk is terrible. It's not even intelligent. That's the reason we've got all kinds of writers that once I write something, my proof guys go through and fix everything. I'm not a great speaker but God's not looking for a silver vessel. He's looking for a surrendered vessel. God could do something more. He can do, he can do greater things through somebody who will yield to him and let him live through them than he will go through people that have all these great talents. Our churches today are full of people that have been educated and they're polished and they've got all of the right clothes on and they've got the right background and all of this stuff, but man, they're straight as a gun barrel and twice as empty. God's looking for somebody who he can take and anoint. You know, Jonathan Edwards is one of the preachers that preached the first great awakening in the United States. And Jonathan Edwards, I've read some, some of his writings and I've read some things about him. And Jonathan Edwards was nearly blind he wore these real thick glasses and he was, he was afraid to be a public speaker. And so he would write out his messages word for word. And because he was so blind, he would have to hold the paper in front of him like this. And so he would stand here and read like this and just every once in a while he'd point. And that was it. <laughs> he would stand in front of people like this and every once in a while point. But the power of God was so strong on him that they said when he preached his message, sinners in the hands of an angry God, that people would literally grab hold of the pews in front of them until their knuckles turned white. They would see themselves falling into hell. And I mean, it caused an awakening across the colonies. And God used him, not because he was the greatest person, not because he's the greatest speaker. Again, we've put too much emphasis on all of this other stuff, which if you've got all that stuff and if you are submitted to God and give it to totally to God, well, then that's great. God's not against people that have talents and abilities, but he's against you taking credit. He is not going to promote you if you are taking all of this credit and taking it unto yourself because it would wind up destroying you and it would wind up destroying the people that would be affected when you fall. I'm telling you, God resists the proud and gives grace to the humble. And then it says, humble yourselves. God doesn't humble you. You can't pray and say, oh God, humble me. That's humiliation when it's done to you. Humble, when, if you humble yourself, you have to do it yourself. It's a choice that you have to make. You have to come to the end of yourself. And you have to say, God... You know, compared to some people, I might have done something good, but compared to you, compared to what you intended me to be, man, I've fallen so far short. I need mercy. 
I don't need justice. I used to develop pictures for a photography studio. And we would have women come in to look at their pictures, you know, and then they would order things and, and it was mainly women. And we'd have them come in and you'd show them their pictures and they'd go, oh, this, this, this isn't good. This doesn't do me justice. And they'd talk about this. And, and you know, if you were going to take them and say, well, let, let us reshoot them. Is that, well, no, I could probably live with this. They were, it was just kind of putting themselves down, hoping that you'd come along and say, oh, this really looks good. It was a way of fishing for a backhanded compliment. But that was a statement that I heard a lot. They'd say, oh, this doesn't do me justice. And I never was bold enough to do it, but I wanted to say, lady, you don't need justice. You need mercy, amen. And I'm telling you, when you're coming before God, and God, why haven't you healed me? And I've done this and I've done that. And how come you haven't done this? You haven't humbled yourself before the presence of God. God doesn't owe us anything except because of his love. Because of his great love, he has obligated himself to us and he wants to move. But as far as your performance, God doesn't know, owe a single person in here anything. This is really in, meant to encourage you. <laughs> Some of you may not feel this is encouraging, but I'm telling you, if you are independent of God. You know, I quoted that verse, Oh Lord, I know that the way of man is not in himself. It is not in man that walks to direct his steps. And I don't think I commented on it, but that's just saying that God gave you the choice. You can run your life. He's not going to force you. But if you have wisdom, you're going to recognize it. You can't run your own life. You have the right to do it. God will let you do it. And that's the reason many of us crash and burn. And, and every problem that we got really comes down to the fact that we did it our way. Us and Frank Sinatra. <laughs> but when you do things God's way, when you just basically have given up your will and God, not what I will, but I want what you want. And when you submit yourselves to God, I guarantee you God's plans for you are better than your plans for yourself. Amen. There's some of you that think if you were to make a total commitment to God, that God certainly is going to just do something bad. He's going to send you to live in a grass hut someplace or he'll take away all of your dreams and visions. I guarantee you God's plans for you are better than your plans for yourself. Amen. Jeremiah chapter 29, verse 11 says, I know the thoughts that I think towards you, says the Lord, thoughts of peace and not of evil to give you an expected end. The NIV says a hope and a future. God has nothing but good plans for you. Psalms 139, I think it's around verse 13, says that while you were still in your mother's womb, this is the NIV, it says, all of your days were written in a book. He has a book that details what every day of your life is supposed to be like. He doesn't force it upon you. You can choose to go your own way, but God has a plan for every single person. There's not a single person in here that is a mistake. Whether your parents knew you were coming, whether they ever told you, I wished you'd have never been born, regardless of what's going on in your life, God knew you and before you were even born had written out all of your days and he has a good plan for you. But I guarantee you, the number one thing that we deal with isn't the devil. It's not all of these other things, which may be a factor. The number one problem in our life is us and our trust in ourself and the fact that we are going to do it by ourselves. And if I could sit down and talk to you, I would imagine that the vast majority of you have lived long enough to know that, man, you've made a lot of dumb decisions you've had some pretty bad things happen. And I tell you, there is no comparison between you doing things your way and doing it God's way. The scripture says there is a way that seems right unto a man, but the end thereof are the ways of death. It says in Proverbs chapter three, verse five, I believe it is, trust in the Lord with all of your heart and lean not unto your own understanding. That's just another way of saying, don't be proud. Don't sit there and do things your way and be self-dependent. 
but rather submit yourself, depend upon God, trust in the Lord with all of your heart and lean not unto your own understanding. In all of your ways, acknowledge him and he shall direct your paths. Brothers, I tell you, men are taught to grow up and you take responsibility and you do things. And there's a, certainly a place for that. But when it comes to our relationship with God, you need to humble yourself. And you need to recognize that even though God has given you the opportunity, the privilege, the choice of running your own life and making your decisions, the right decision is to say, God, I'm not smart enough to run my own life. I need you. What do you want? What did you create me for? What is your will? You need to humble yourself. And again, you can tell where you are in that process by whether or not you have taken care upon yourself or whether you've cast your care over on the Lord. You know, again, I'm not saying that I'm a perfect example by any means, but I have grown in this area. And I tell you, we have, uh, I figured out the other day, I have to have $11,000 an hour, 24 hours a day, seven days a week. 365 days out of the year, and yet I never worry about it. I don't stay up at night. I don't have any problem about finances. I've cast my care about it over on the Lord, and I am carefree. You can ask the people that work for me. They, they take, that's what I hired them for. <laughs> I hired Billy, and he said, what are you gonna pay me? And I said, that's your first worry right there. <laughs> So I, I, I just don't worry about stuff. I've cast it over on the Lord. I'm not perfect, but man, I'm growing in this area. And I tell you, you need to get to a place to where you can go through life to where it's God's responsibility. God's the one who has a plan for you. You are submitted unto him and it's his responsibility to bring things to pass. And you don't have to take the responsibility and all the weight and care of these things upon your back. Amen. 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 Praise God. So verse six, humble yourselves. Therefore, don't wait on God to humble you. That's humiliation, but humble yourselves under the mighty hand of God that he may exalt you in due time. Did you know if you truly are humble, God will exalt you and you have to be humble enough to receive the exaltation. And if you are sitting there thinking, man, I would, I'll never let God exalt me because you think that's pride. Well, then that's pride. You are exalting your will above God. He said, if you humble yourself, he will exalt you. If you're like Moses, he says, Moses, you're the meekest man on the face of the earth. Now you write this down. And he would have been in pride if he hadn't have obeyed God. God will promote you. You know, God's blessed me. We've got... I don't even know, $130 million worth of assets that we accumulated in nine years, debt free. And man, I praise God for it, but I don't take credit for it. It's God. It was God that did it. And those people that are here with us, they've seen it. It's nothing but God. It's not my great ability. I'm a part of it in the sense that I had to allow God to do it through me, but I certainly don't take credit for it. This is a supernatural miracle of God. So if you humble yourself, he will exalt you in due time, casting all your care upon him for he careth for you. And then the next verse says, be sober, be vigilant because your adversary, the devil, as a roaring lion seek, walketh about seeking whom he may devour. Again, I don't think that that is disconnected from everything else. Brothers, if you are walking in pride, which again, isn't just arrogance, but pride is self-sufficiency, Pride is you are self-confident. You can handle this. God, you just get me introduced and on the stage and I can take it from here. That's pride. And if you're in pride, Satan, that is his inroad into your life. Did you know that this was Satan's sin in Isaiah chapter 14? It talks about Lucifer and he said, I will be like the most high God. I will exalt my throne above the sides of the north. I will sit on the sides of the north. I will be like the most high God. It was all pride. Pride was the original sin. Pride is Satan's inroad into our life. 
Again, I say that if you were dead to yourself, if you had truly become a living sacrifice where you have died to yourself, Jesus said that it's in losing your life that you find what life is really all about. And if we were to do that and become dead to ourselves, you could take a corpse up here and you could spit on the corpse, you could kick the corpse, you could insult the corpse, you could ignore the corpse. And if it's a corpse, it's not going to be affected. If people criticize you and it just makes you fall apart like a $2 suitcase, if somebody does something, if they pass over you and promote somebody else and people say something about you and you take offense, it's because you are too alive to yourself. It's because you are too important to yourself. Amen. I know that really blesses you. It's intended to bless you. If you would receive it and understand, just like that verse I quoted already in uh, Proverbs chapter 13, verse 10, only by pride comes contention. Only. And if you look that up in the Hebrew, it means only by pride <laughs> comes contention. There isn't anything else. Some of you think, well, no, you don't understand. That's my personality. I'm a type A personality. No, it's only pride it's not your personality trait. Well, I was born with a temper. You could be delivered of that. <laughs> the only thing that makes you contentious is the fact that you are so promoting of yourself. Amen. You know, I had an instance when I was in Pritchett, Colorado that there, anyway, it's a long story, but I pastored a little church. There was 10 people in the church when I got there. We saw a man raised from the dead and there was only 144 people in the whole town and we started having 100 come to church. So we had miraculous growth for the size of the community we were in. But one of the elders of the church took offense at this. He wanted to go back down to the 10 people. He wanted to sing out of the hymnals and I didn't sing out of the hymnals and he started criticizing me over things. And so anyway, he turned against me and he started telling people lies about me that I was stealing money from the church. I didn't even take a salary. He said I was committing adultery, that I was doing dope and getting drunk. And he just lied about me and attacked me. And I went in and confronted him and he yelled at me and let me have it. And anyway, I knew what he was saying wasn't true. So it really didn't bother me that much. And I forgave him and I prayed for him. And so the next week, I was in the habit of every time I went by his business, I'd just stop in as a pastor and say hi to him. And so I stopped in front of his business and Jamie was in the car with me. And I said, you want to go in with me? And she said, no. <laughs> and I just went in by myself. And I mean, he was very cool towards me and wouldn't hardly talk to me. And so after a few minutes, I came out and I got back in the car and I told Jamie, I said, I don't know, something's wrong. He's, he's bothered about something. It wasn't the way it used to be. And she just looked at me like, don't you remember what he's been saying about you? And I had forgotten. Some of you think I'm weird. I think you're weird. I think you're weird to sit there and be so in love with yourself that if somebody lies about you, why is it going to bother you? You know, when I bowed my knee to the Lord, March the 23rd, 1968, and I desired to put him first again, I'm still in process. I haven't arrived, but that was my desire. And I've been trying to do that for 55 years. I got to where really all I have to have is his approval. That's all. And I've had people just like I, that story I was telling, I've had people come against me. We've had front page articles here about what a terrible person I am and and people say and do things all of the time. And the way I respond to that is just to go back to my relationship with the Lord. God, am I pleasing to you? Are, are you accepting me? Am I doing what you told me to do? And if I feel God's pleasure with me, it just doesn't really matter about what anybody else has to say. I had a man come up after I preached a message similar to this and he walked up and he just started reading me the riot act and telling me everything I'd said that was wrong. And the sad fact was some of what he was saying was right. And anyway, he was just letting me have it. And I just stopped him right in the middle of it. And I said, who died and made you God? And he just looked at me like, what are you saying? I said, you aren't God. I don't give a rip what you think. 
I said, all I'm out to do is to please God. And I know that God is pleased with me, not because I do everything right, but because faith pleases God and I'm seeking God. And I said, God's pleased with me. And if he's pleased with me, I just don't care what you think. And he said, well, you should. And I said, I don't. I said, compared to God, you're a nobody. Brothers, you know why it bothers you so much when somebody comes out and criticizes you, especially if they're saying a lie about you, misrepresenting you? It's because you love yourself and your reputation and you want people to love you so much and you want to be so accepted in the sight of people that your reputation is just paramount to you. But that's the wrong attitude. You don't need to be like that. The Lord said, vengeance is mine, thus saith the Lord. I'll repay Man, if I had time, I need to quit. But if I had time, I could tell you at least two or three stories. There's one man that lives right here in Woodland Park that at one time told people I was of the devil and made them burn my tapes and books and do things. And uh, he just gave me a hard time. And you know what? I knew about it, but I never retaliated. I never said anything to him about it. I just blessed the guy. Because again, I was concerned about what God said. I didn't have to be right. I didn't have to prove myself right. And I was in Colorado Springs. This has been 20 years ago or more. And there was a guy there. And every time he spoke seven times in a week, he had me come up and just greet the people and say something to the people before he got up and ministered. And it turned out that this guy who had been telling everybody I was of the devil and making them burn my materials, he was in the audience. And finally, the last night after seven times in front of about 700 people, this guy came up on the stage while I was greeting the people and got down on his hands and knees and started crying and uh, dripping his tears all over my boots. And he apologized in front of 700 people. And he says, I'm so sorry for what I've said. And God defended me. God took care of that. And that man now, every time we have a healing school here, this man is always here at everyone. And every time I see him, he comes up. He says, you know, I love you. And I said, yes, I know you love me. And God has just put us back together. And it's miraculous. God will take care of you better than you will take care of yourself. You don't have to defend yourself. You don't have to always be per, uh, perceived as being right. And I could give you dozens of stories just like that. I'm telling you, brothers, one of the keys to seeing God move in your life is to humble yourself. And so I only got to the third revelation. <laughs> a revelation of hell, a revelation of what salvation was. And then after I became a Pharisee, I had a revelation of my own relative unworthiness compared to God. And I had to humble myself and start exalting God instead of exalting myself. And I tell you, that has transformed my life. That would have the same effect on any person here. And I know that there's many of you think, well, man, we need to go on to some of these other revelations. I don't have a problem in this area. <laughs> You're the very person that needs this. Your wife is praying. If she's watching right now, she's praying with everything she's got. Oh, Holy Spirit, convict him. None of us have arrived in this area. Every one of us, it's a living sacrifice. It's a continual thing. And I tell you, this whole world system is just contrary to this. To find people that will truly give God the credit and exalt him and be God dependent to where they don't depend upon themselves, that's as rare as hen's teeth. And for those of you that are city boys, hens don't have teeth. <laughs> it's rare to find people who are truly God dependent. You know, Moses in the 33rd or 34th chapter of the book of Exodus, he was praying and says, oh God, show me your glory. And God said, I will be with you and I will go with you and lead you in the way that you should go. And Moses responded by saying, God, I was asking for your glory. I'm taking it for granted that you're going with us. If you go not with us, I'm not moving from here. That's a great attitude. The man who probably saw as many miracles as any Old Testament saint ever saw, splitting the Red Sea and the 10 plagues and all of the things that he did was a humble man who was so dependent upon God. He says, if you don't go with me, I'm not moving. 
I imagine that God put this on my heart for the people that are here, not all of the people that didn't come. And I bet you that there's people right here that you've got your life planned and you would like to see God's blessing, but if God doesn't show up, okay, you've been doing it on your own for a long time. You got your life planned out, you can do it. You need to come to a place to where God, I'm not moving until I get you controlling my life. And I tell you, if you would do that, it's not a negative thing, it's a positive thing. Romans chapter 12, verse one says, I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, it's the goodness of God that beseeches you to become a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable unto God, which is just your reasonable service. It's the goodness of God. God's plans for you are better than yourself. You know, I can look back and I can truthfully say that I couldn't have even dreamed some of the things that God has done in my life. I couldn't have planned things. I couldn't have done it. The people that God has brought me, I could start just going through some of the people that we've got right here and how that they've been trained for a whole life and God has just brought them here. God has put us together. He's done things that I couldn't have ever done on my own. I couldn't have planned any of these things. God's plans for you are better than your plans for yourself. And so I'm beseeching you by the goodness of God, the mercies of God, that you would yield yourself and humble yourself and make a commitment to let God absolutely control you. Amen. Praise God. Amen. So again, every single one of us has to continue in this, even if God has shown you these things and you're already moving in that direction. And so I'm not asking everyone to respond. Some of you have already started this journey and God is showing you these things and maybe this is just a reminder. And I want you to be humble enough not to respond to this invitation. But if some of you here would say, brother, this is I'm going in the opposite direction. I'm, I've been running my own life. I depend, lean unto my own understanding. I've got care, worry. I'm burned out. I've been trying it on my own and it's not working. And man, I need to humble myself so that God could exalt me in due time. If you hadn't started that process and if God has spoken to you tonight, I want to ask you to be humble enough right now to just stand right where you are and I'm going to pray a prayer, lead you in a prayer of commitment. And if that's you, just stand right where you are and I want to pray with you and we want to start this journey. And again, if you've already started, even if you haven't arrived, but you know, if this is a revelation and it's just a reminder, I'm not asking you to stand. These are people that are saying, I haven't really dealt with this. This is something I need to commit myself to right now. Those are the ones that I won't stand in. And let me say it this way. I'm not gonna pray for anybody who's not standing. If you're gonna receive this, you gotta humble yourself and you gotta stand. If you're seated, this won't work for you. Amen. See, there's a few folks still getting up you were trying to bootleg this prayer. <laughs> Praise God. Awesome. Father, we love you and we thank you so much. Thank you that you made us, that you created us. And even when we were in our mother's womb, you had a purpose. You had all of our days written out. We believe that you've got a perfect plan for our life. <laughs> And for those of us who are standing, Father, we are just saying that we have not followed your plan. We've been self-sufficient. We've been depending upon ourselves. We've been doing it our way. And tonight we are convicted. And Father, we just say that we, by standing, we are humbling ourselves and yielding ourselves. Like Romans 12, 1, we are making ourselves a living sacrifice. We're crawling up on the altar. And we're asking for the fire of God to come. You said that if we humble ourselves, that you will exalt us in due time. And so, Father, we're humbling ourselves. We've stood in front of our brothers here tonight, admitting that this has been a deficiency in our life. And so, Father, we have humbled ourselves. We ask for your supernatural fire to fall. 
Father, however you revealed to me 55 years ago that I was depending upon myself, trusting in my own goodness, and that you helped me to turn from that and to see that it's only you, I pray that the Holy Spirit somehow works that same thing in every single person's life who's standing. Father, we just make that commitment right now. And I believe that you accept this sacrifice. I believe that, Father, you are changing people's hearts, that people will yield themselves to you. And we thank you in advance that your plans are better than our plans. And we praise you that this is going to be the beginning of a brand new level of, of victory in our life. We thank you by faith. And we speak that in the mighty name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Praise the Lord. Amen. You can be seated. You know, I've been referring to March the 23rd, 1968. I've never gotten over it. Those of you who prayed that, if you meant it with all of your heart, you need to refer to March the 9th. Isn't that the date? March the 9th, 2023. That this is the day that God began something on the inside of you. And I tell you, it's going to make a huge difference. Let me also say that if there's anybody who stood and made that commitment, and if you had never made Jesus your personal Lord, before, well, then that, in a sense, is what you were doing just then. You were making Jesus your Lord. You were turning from yourself and you were looking to Him to be your Savior. It says in Romans 10, 9, that if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God raised Him from the dead, you shall be saved. So if you had never made that uh, profession of your faith in the Lord public before, we're going to ask our <laughs> prayer team to come down here, our prayer ministers, and I want to invite you to come and just come forward and tell someone that, you know what, I'm not only just going to start depending upon the Lord, but I am receiving salvation. I'm making Jesus my Lord. And so if you've never done that, I want you to come down here and just tell one of these guys and let them pray with you. Also, if you've already been born again, but if you don't speak in tongues which I hadn't got time to teach on this, but the Bible says that once you receive the Holy Spirit, you receive power from on high. And in the book of Acts, when they received the Holy Spirit, they spoke with tongues. And I know that sounds strange if this is new to you, but it really is powerful. The Bible says when you pray in tongues, it's your spirit praying. It bypasses the confusion in your mind. You're praying straight from your spirit, bypassing all of this junk that's up here. And you're praying to God and communicating with him spirit to spirit. And I tell you, it's powerful. The Bible says you build yourself up on your most holy faith. So if you've never received that, if you haven't spoken in tongues, every one of these people down here has already received salvation and the baptism of the Holy Spirit, and they can pray with you and help you to receive this gift. And I promise you, we would love to minister that to you. Now, we're going to be ministering to people the rest of the week. We're going to have Jeremy and E.W., myself, Billy, Epperhart are going to be ministering. And we're going to have prayer down here. We'll pray with you as much as you'd like. We'll pray with you till we rub all the hair off the top of your head. So uh, we aren't trying to get away from it, but just for time's sake tonight, if you've got one of those things I've called out, I'd like you to come. And then the rest of this meeting, we'll be praying for people for healing or for whatever it is that you need. So let's everybody stand right now. And if you're one of those that needs to come down here and confess publicly in front of people that you have made Jesus your Lord, or if you are one of those that needs to receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit and speak in tongues, just come forward right now before people begin to be dismissed. And before they leave, just come forward and let someone pray with you if there's anything we can do to help you. Amen.